The scene commenced in Reifenheim, the capital of the Antares Empire, where giant-sized monsters were wreaking havoc, defeating the town's soldiers, demolishing houses, and setting the town ablaze. Despite the formidable challenge posed by the monsters, the town's soldiers continued their valiant struggle. The king lamented that their military, two million strong, had succumbed to the evil demon they had inadvertently summoned. A soldier reported to the king that the demonic summoning and a wide-range magic attack had resulted in 200,000 deaths and an additional 300,000 injuries. Nonetheless, the king declared that although the demon king had brought ruin upon their nation and cast a shadow over the world, this malevolence would end. He proclaimed that the evil demon king would be vanquished by the true heroes. In response, the soldier expressed gratitude to the king, crediting his majesty's wisdom for their hopeful situation. Subsequently, the scene shifted to the Hall of Abyss at the center of the grand demonic palace known as Gerak. Here, a hero named Alex von Hallein sternly told the demon king that it was time for him to end his malevolent actions and return to the darkness from whence he came. It was revealed that the demon king was none other than Reifenhart Wald Antares, formerly the emperor of the Antares Empire. Cyrus, the sword saint, informed Reifenhart of their intent to eradicate him and terminate the history of his dark empire. Feeling disappointed, Reifenhart conveyed to Cyrus how upsetting he found these accusations. He argued that he had invested much in building the empire and questioned why Cyrus labeled it a dark empire when it was called Antares, where the sun also rose, highlighting Cyrus's oversight. Marshal King Teslan, incensed by Reifenhart's words, retorted that Reifenhart was cultivating demons. He asserted that once Reifenhart was removed, the inherent demonic nature of these corrupt monsters would also vanish. Reifenhart maintained that demonic nature was irrelevant, arguing that these creatures inherently possessed such traits and that he had merely taught them human tactics. He explained that having endured mistreatment throughout their lives, he had instructed them in methods of retaliation, asserting that their actions mirrored typical human behavior rather than inherent corruption. Suddenly, Reifenhart realized something and inquired whether the heroes had already defeated all his four heavenly kings. Cyrus confirmed that the orcs had been no match for his sword. Upon hearing of the orcs' defeat, Reifenhart reacted with anger, unable to believe the news of the brave and great orc warrior, Tathid's death. Despite their barbaric appearance, Reifenhart defended the orcs as an innocent species of hunter-gatherers who never betray their own, protect the weak, and confront the strong. He was outraged at how some perceived them as monsters. Teslan, wearing an arrogant smile, spoke of the four heavenly kings and remarked that the sickening monstrous troll had just paid for their sins. Upon learning of Gurit's death, Reifenhart began to cry, lamenting that even Gurit Athilka was no more. He wondered aloud if he had been too harsh in considering trolls merely as nature lovers who focused on spirituality. The saintess, Flynn, reported that the evil dwarf who worshipped the god of darkness had also been brought to justice. Reifenhart expressed heartbreak over Michelin's death, dismayed that Alpath, the god of dwarves, was labeled a god of dark. He criticized their arrogance in deeming all gods, other than the Sayer and the Twelve Gods, as evil beings. Jade Aralite, the Mage of Light, proudly announced that they had sent the corrupt Dark Elf to the beyond, asserting that she had been no match for their magic. Upon hearing of Ciri's death, Reifenhart became furious, declaring that with Ciri's demise, they all seemed to be begging to be killed. As Reifenhart displayed his anger, Teslan commented that he was finally showing his true colors, labeling the Dark Elf as a demon who had succumbed to darkness, deserving no pity. Reifenhart, covering his face with his hand in disappointment, countered that the Dark Elf's skin might have appeared darker because humans had cut down all the trees, forcing her to move to barren lands. He questioned the logic of labeling a pure-blooded High Elf as a Dark Elf simply because she had gotten tanned. However, Alex, Cyrus, Teslan, Flynn, and Jade were all prepared to confront Reifenhart, with Alex declaring his intent to avenge the dead with his sword. Reifenhart, his gaze filled with anger, told them they seemed unwilling to listen, questioning who would avenge the otherworldly dead if not them. 
Then Alex exclaimed to Reifenhardt that his actions were despicable, arguing that without Reifenhardt's evil powers, the monsters would not have been corrupted to the dark side, instead, they would have lived their destined normal lives. As Reifenhardt observed them still advancing to engage him in battle, he reflected that there was no use, they simply would not listen. To them, otherworldly species were merely creatures of darkness aspiring to live beyond servitude, and for that alone, they deemed them worthy of death. Resigned to their perception, Reifenhardt decided to embrace the role of the demon king they accused him of being. Then, Reifenhardt unleashed his power in a forceful attack directed towards all his adversaries. Once an ordinary great mage, though being a great mage was hardly ordinary, Reifenhardt had come to see that humans did not view otherworldly species as equals. Elves were treated as aesthetically pleasing servants with long lifespans, dwarves, as laborers skilled in crafting and mining, orcs, suitable for physical labor and trolls, mere ingredients for healing potions, stripped of autonomy and will. Shocked upon discovering their rich cultures and traditions, Reifenhardt immersed himself in their worlds, learning spiritual magic from elves and sorcery from trolls. This fusion of knowledge allowed him to achieve unprecedented ten-circle magic. His engagement with these species transformed his perspective, compelling him to rescue them from enslavement. As their territory expanded, so did human resistance, leading to raids. Despite merely defending themselves, these skirmishes often resulted in them claiming more land, eventually forming the Antares Empire. Reifenhardt clarified that establishing the empire was not driven by a disdain for humans but by a belief in the equality of all species. During Reifenhardt's attack, Alex was struck severely and succumbed to his injuries. Teslan, witnessing his fall, cried out his name. Reifenhardt noted that Alex, though well-rounded, lacked sufficient strength. He remarked that heroes might thrive in stories, but in reality, specializing was preferable. Reifenhardt recognized Teslan, known for his robust physique, as his most formidable opponent. In his grief and rage, Teslan struck the ground with all his might, creating a shockwave that swept everything away, including Reifenhardt. Teslan then charged at Reifenhardt, intent on defeating him. Catching up, Teslan leaped towards Reifenhardt and delivered a powerful blow to his head, proclaiming victory over the demon king. The attack drew blood from Reifenhardt's mouth, yet he coughed and informed Teslan that he had managed to block the attack with magic. Teslan responded, acknowledging Reifenhardt as the leader of the demons, as expected. Despite the animosity, Reifenhardt's actions and motivations revealed a complex character, torn between his protective instincts for his people and the hostile misinterpretations of his adversaries. As blood splashed and flowed from Reifenhardt's head, he muttered to himself, realizing that his spine was broken. He understood that his demise was imminent and that victory against his opponent, Teslan, was out of reach. Teslan informed Reifenhardt that he would be sent to his judgment. Acknowledging Teslan's victory, Reifenhardt conceded that it was a good outcome for him. Teslan then speculated that others would finally be freed from their demonic restraints. However, Reifenhardt found himself unable to accept this. He pondered whether living as slaves was truly their natural fate, free from these so-called demonic restraints, a notion too maddening for him to embrace. In a desperate move, Reifenhardt retrieved a gadget, the Eye of Time and Space, a magical artifact he had discovered in an ancient ruin. He explained its incredible potential, admitting that even he, a practitioner of ten-circle magic, had yet to fully understand its capabilities. Seeing the Eye of Time and Space in Reifenhardt's hand, Teslan demanded angrily what Reifenhardt intended to do. Reifenhardt declared his intention to attempt a time and space regression spell, which could potentially reverse time and disrupt the god's providence. Although uncertain of its efficacy, he was determined to proceed, challenging Teslan to stop him if he could. As Teslan tried to intervene, Reifenhardt initiated the procedure. Teslan's attempt to strike Reifenhardt was met with a blast created by the time and space magic. The scene then shifted to a serene morning, characterized by the melodic chirping of birds outside a house. Inside, Reifenhardt woke up to unfamiliar sounds, warmth, and comfort, 
questioning if he was still alive and whether his audacious spell had succeeded. He marveled at the effectiveness of the spell, acknowledging his genius but surprised by the outcome. Uncertain of his location, he considered the possibility that he had jumped timelines or returned to a past he faintly remembered. Inside a beautiful wooden house, Reifenhart got out of bed. Upon seeing his new young body, he felt a sense of pride, murmuring to himself that most young men would likely envy his physique. After seeing himself, Reifenhart was shocked and muttered to himself, questioning who he was. When Reifenhart beheld his body and hand, he experienced disappointment, remarking to himself about the presence of calluses, scars, and the muscular covering of his body, finding them repulsive. He questioned the necessity of a six-pack for a mage, believing that skill in magic was sufficient. Reflecting on his past, he recalled how his youthful physique had charmed numerous ladies, while in his older age, he had evoked sorrow in several elves. After seeing his face in the big mirror, Reifenhart became confused and wondered what was up with his current appearance. He pondered where his statuesque-like features had gone and why his body now resembled more of a statue. He questioned whether his time and space regression spell had failed, leading to him inhabiting some random guy's body. Despite the familiarity of the face he now wore, he considered the possibility that he hadn't traveled to the past but had instead swapped souls with the body's original inhabitant in the present. Reflecting on the thick, brown eyebrows, tenacious-looking eyes, and stubborn mouth, he speculated on the potential changes to come, such as a larger torso and the growth of facial hair. Then, to his surprise, he discovered that he had acquired the body of none other than the indomitable Martial King, Teslon. Before he could think more, a towering figure, nearly twice the size of young Teslon, appeared at the door and admonished Reifenhart, questioning why he hadn't yet emerged outside and noting that the sun was high in the sky. Seeing that man shouting at him, Reifenhart felt a sense of fear. However, the man then laughed and encouraged Reifenhart, suggesting they should have another great day together. Reifenhart, sweating in fear, nervously asked the man who he was, wondering if he might be a monster. The man, with a concerned expression, inquired why Reifenhart was looking at him as if it were his first time seeing him. As Reifenhart became more afraid, he replied hesitantly, stating that he was asking because he genuinely didn't know. With a pensive expression on his face, the man inquired of Teslon whether he had previously employed amnesia as an excuse twice. He expressed certainty that Teslon was aware that such an excuse would no longer be effective. However, the man grabbed Teslon's head and dragged him outside, even though Teslon was only wearing his shorts. He instructed him to proceed to the training area. Upon hearing about training from the man, Reifenhart pondered to himself that the individual seemed to be Teslin's teacher, the continent's strongest martial artist of all time, Martial King Gerard Crom Protes, who was now a former martial king. In the next scene, Gerard tied Teslon tightly to a big tree, rendering him immobile. Teslon, unable to move, politely requested Gerard to listen to him. Instead of listening to Teslon, Gerard tied his mouth with a cloth and told him to shut up, remarking that he was being very talkative that day. But Reifenhart became terrified when he saw that Gerard had started the training by taking a bamboo. Reifenhart, already filled with fear at the prospect of what might happen, was struck by Gerard with such force using the bamboo that water flowed from both his eyes and mouth. Reifenhart wondered what was happening. He felt a mix of anger and fear toward Gerard. After being relentlessly beaten by Gerard, he reflected on Cirrus, lamenting that this was how he had met his demise. While beating Teslon with the bamboo, Gerard thought to himself that Teslon's hands had felt different earlier, softer than usual. He wondered if Teslon truly had amnesia. In their martial clan, Jim Unbreakable, the training was known for being simple, rigorous, and sometimes even excessive. It wasn't uncommon for trainees to experience short-term memory loss as a result. Gerard recalled instances when he himself had lost his memory briefly in the past. However, he considered it a minor issue with a simple solution. Then Gerard began to beat Teslon more harshly, suggesting that he would feel better after being beaten up. Reifenhart, in tears, expressed his agony and pleaded for assistance to rescue him. 
Ignoring Teslin's pleading, Gerard persisted in beating him, asserting that humans use weapons because of their inherent weakness, relying on armor and weaponry due to their weak physiques. Reifenhart pondered why Gerard had referred to humans as stupid for their utilization of tools. Gerard then became excited and shouted at Teslan, asserting that it was an excuse and the shame of someone who couldn't overcome their weaknesses. He emphasized that martial artists trained specifically to overcome their weaknesses. Reifenhart thought that it was the first time he had ever heard such simple and stupid logic in his entire life. After breaking a lot of bamboo on Reifenhart, Gerard stated that humans were akin to steel, asserting that the more you beat up a human, the stronger they became, much like steel. After Gerard made his statement, Reifenhart pondered how people could be likened to steel. Gerard took another bamboo and told Teslan that he was the student Gerard had chosen and urged him to believe that he had no physical limits and could become like steel. Teslan became afraid upon hearing Gerard's words. Gerard then became serious and conveyed to Teslan that not everyone could become stronger through training. He likened it to how only high-quality iron could transform into steel, emphasizing that only a select few could attain a steel-like physique. After beating Teslan once more, he shouted at him to consider the ocean. He emphasized that the sea engulfs everything without altering its nature, urging Teslan to bring out the ocean within himself. After hearing all of Gerard's statements, Reifenhart remarked that it was a load of nonsense. He scoffed, muttering about the sea and the ocean. Finally, Gerard spared Teslan and instructed him that it was enough for the day, so he should go inside and rest. After enduring Gerard's rigorous training regimen, Reifenhart expressed gratitude for his toughness, acknowledging that, despite being battered, he managed to survive and wasn't dead. The scene transitioned to a night setting, with Reifenhart relaxing in a bathtub brimming with a special potion. He remarked with surprise about the abundant healing potion, comparing it to the cost of a bottle. Teslan mentioned hearing about the queen's milk baths for great skin but found them inferior to the potion-filled bathtub. He turned to Gerard, asking about the purpose of the medical bath. Gerard responded, asking what was meant by the statement. He emphasized the necessity of cooling down steel after it has been hammered. Reifenhart pondered that after training his musculoskeletal system almost to the point of exhaustion, he was able to recover quickly through the use of aura and restorative potions. This method allowed his body to recuperate before succumbing to illness, ultimately making him stronger. Reflecting on his encounter with Teslan, he speculated that Teslan must have undergone similar rigorous training from a young age. He wondered about the existence of his younger self in this timeline and questioned whether two identical souls could inhabit the same time-space dimension. Considering this possibility, he formulated two hypotheses, firstly, that both his future self and the one within Teslin's body coexisted with his younger self, and secondly, that Marshal King Teslin's soul resided within the body of his younger self. The next day, Gerard provided Teslan with a large quantity of meats and instructed him to consume them all. As Teslan ate, he gradually put on weight. Gerard explained that an overworked body needs to replenish its nutrients. After finishing his meal, Teslan was taken by Gerard to climb a mountain to aid digestion, which Gerard considered a light job. While Gerard managed the climb with ease, Teslan struggled, burdened by a heavy barrel on his back and grew tired during the ascent. Upon reaching the mountain peak, Gerard inquired if Teslan was tired or if they should proceed with their morning training. Hearing about more training, Teslan hesitated but nonetheless continued with his exercises. He hung from an old tree branch, still carrying the heavy barrel, while Gerard watched from another branch. Exhausted from the training, Teslan muttered about the duration of their severe regimen. That night, Teslan finally had the chance to lie down in his bed and rest. While resting, he cried, contemplating that he had reincarnated into the past Teslan. Sitting in a corner of the room, Teslan put his finger in his mouth, deeply considering how to escape. He pondered the potential consequences of the two souls coming into contact, viewing each soul's uniqueness as an immutable rule that underpins the world. He feared that, if unlucky, 
his soul might vanish, preventing teenage Reifenhart from becoming an active mage in ten years. Teslan envisioned Reifenhart spending his days engrossed in studies at the Delphia Magic Tower, which made an encounter unlikely. However, he worried about the possibility of Teslan taking over his body, given Teslan's formidable strength from training at Gym Unbreakable. Nevertheless, he reassured himself that Teslan's powers were currently limited, hoping he would not reach the tenth circle. Considering Teslan's need for a master's guidance at Gym Unbreakable, he thought it possible that Teslan might find a way on his own due to his current advancement level. Yet, he concluded that escaping from this confinement was his immediate priority. Teslan left his room and dashed towards the jungle as quickly as he could, proclaiming his intent to flee, regardless of his actions that night. As he made his escape, he was surprised to find Gerard seated on a rock. Gerard questioned where he was heading, addressing him as, Disciple. Surprised to see Gerard outside, Teslan wondered when he had arrived, likening him to a monster, that old man. Gerard remarked to Teslan that he had been quiet for a month or two, and now he was attempting to flee again. He noted that it seemed to be the ninth time, and they would soon reach double digits. However, Teslan explained to Gerard that he honestly was not the boy named Teslan, but rather his name was Reifenhart. Gerard inquired of Teslan if that was indeed his story this time. Teslan could not comprehend what Gerard was implying. Gerard further mentioned to Teslan that last time he had claimed to come from another world, talking about encounters with dragons and gods. He questioned Teslan about his previous existence in the Huan Empire on the eastern continent, known as Murin, where Teslan supposedly had been an active master before reincarnating or something similar. However, this time, Teslan's narrative seemed somewhat more convincing. Gerard acknowledged Teslan's improvement and suggested they return and rest. Gerard dragged Teslan towards his room by pulling his hair. Due to Gerard's intervention, which not only prevented Teslan from escaping but also involved dragging him by his hair, Teslan expressed frustration, asserting that he had failed that day but would undoubtedly succeed the following day. He acknowledged his failure at prison breaking but emphasized that he would not remain trapped there indefinitely. Teslan attempted to escape multiple times, but Gerard intercepted him on each occasion, reminding him that he too had attempted similar feats during his discipleship. Teslan even made an underwater escape attempt, but Gerard apprehended him, prompting Teslan to realize the futility of his actions. After each capture, Gerard brought Teslan back by pulling him by the hair and reassuring him that if he waited and endured a bit longer, his efforts would be rewarded. Teslan finally conceded defeat, realizing that his repeated attempts to escape and subsequent captures by Gerard were futile. He recognized that trying to evade a man dubbed the Demon King was an exercise in futility, as he had yet to grasp the concept of surrender. Gerard informed Teslan that Jim Unbreakable had developed a disciple escape prevention method over the course of 130 years. He explained that throughout their history, all disciples had either feigned illness or attempted to escape. Even if one managed to escape, the authorities would spare no effort in pursuing them to the ends of the continent. Therefore, Gerard suggested that it would be wiser for Teslan to seek official permission before attempting to descend the mountain. Two years passed, during which Teslan endured Gerard's rigorous training regimen, spending his time within the confines of the prison overflowing with love. In that span, Teslan developed an eight-pack physique and successfully awakened his aura. Teslan pondered that he had heard that even Cyrus, who had been praised as the sword saint, only awakened his aura in his late twenties. He expressed surprise at achieving this stage when he wasn't even twenty. Seeing Teslan shocked, Gerard laughed and explained to him that with the training of Jim Unbreakable, such occurrences were expected. He explained that by stimulating the survival instinct alongside physical training, one's will to live increases vitality, and this heightened power manifests as an aura. Gerard, wielding a spiked bat, informed Teslan that the impact no longer hurt him. He then suggested that they should move to the next phase of training. Teslan, no longer fearful but rather excited about his training, inquired of Gerard if they would be shifting to more traditional martial arts and wondered if this progression meant he might soon descend the mountain. 
he also sought clarification on the current focus of their training. Gerard, with a broad grin, suggested to Teslon that they engage in sparring training together. Teslon was left speechless upon hearing about the new training. Three more years elapsed, shifting the scene to the Vasili Kingdom in the southern region. Terran was training in the rugged terrain of the Larched Mountains. This time, Teslan's body appeared stronger than before. Practicing the Calamity Horn technique, Terran repeatedly punched the mountain at the same spot with full strength. He pondered if the third superposition was his limit but felt he just needed to push a bit more to make it work. Terran explained the Calamity Horn technique, where one concentrated all their strength into one spot of their body, channeling aura to resemble a horn, thus the name, Calamity Horn. He expressed his need to refine the technique to reach the fourth superposition, knowing that its final stage, the ninth superposition, could even kill gods. However, he reflected on the limitations of Teslan, who could only achieve seven superpositions, and Master Gerard, who could manage the eighth. His master had advised him to reach at least the fourth superposition before descending the mountain. Anticipating that his master might take his time having a drink in the village, Terran decided to conclude his stamina training for the day, noting that in the past, he might have seized the opportunity to escape. Afterward, Teslan attempted his arrow bullet power, murmuring, Delfer Lustellum. His power manifested an air bullet aimed at an enemy. However, when he tried to use it, he struck a tree, leaving marks and smoke in its wake. Teslan lamented that his body wasn't supporting him. Despite vividly recalling all his magic knowledge through an artificial flashback, his mana wasn't building, and his stone body lacked arithmetic ability. He questioned whether he could truly become a mage. Suddenly, Teslan felt an unusual energy that didn't seem human. As someone emerged from behind a tree, Teslan thought that the energy he sensed belonged to an orc. He noted that, based on the creature's size, it was likely three or four years old and seemed to be a runaway, possibly escaping from somewhere akin to the arena. The orc was shivering in fear but pretended to be brave as he told Teslan that if Teslan pretended not to have seen him, then the orc wouldn't kill him. Teslan mentioned that the orc was attempting to engage in dialogue since he wasn't displaying hostility. He remarked on the prideful nature of his race, expressing a reluctance towards unnecessary violence, even in such circumstances. So, Teslan inquired of the orc whether someone was chasing him. The orc was surprised by how a human like Teslan knew the language of grace. Teslan mentioned to the orc that he had experienced a fateful encounter. Feeling a bit tense, the orc informed Teslan that indeed it was a blessed encounter, agreeing with him that he was being chased. Teslan expressed to the orc that he wanted to assist him and inquired whether he could trust him. The orc replied to Teslan, saying that he knew the language of grace and considered Teslan to be like a brother. He expressed that he could sense Teslan's genuine kindness in his very soul. However, he cautioned Teslan, mentioning that helping him would put Teslan in danger as well. Impressed by the orc, Teslan wondered about his eloquence, considering if he hailed from a noble bloodline. He then assured the orc of his ability to help, urging him to trust in him. After casting a spell, Teslan created a magical pathway on the mountain. He explained to the orc that his magic would conceal him. The orc expressed surprise and inquired of Teslan whether he was indeed a mage. Teslan, seeing the orc's surprise at his mage abilities, inquired if it seemed odd for him to be a mage given his strong physique. On the way out, the orc expressed gratitude to Teslan, stating that he would gratefully accept his kindness. After the orc passed through the secret magical path, it vanished. However, Teslan overheard a conversation among mercenaries. They were searching for the orc, expressing their irritation and questioning if they had to go through all the trouble just to earn a few silver coins. Upon seeing Teslan already present, one of the mercenaries named Bright asked if he had seen a young orc pass by. Another mercenary mentioned they would give him a gold coin if he told them. However, Bright interrupted, questioning the mention of the gold coin. The other mercenary responded that nobody was actually going to give it to him and suggested they listen to what he knows and then ignore him. 
Teslan informed them that he hadn't seen any orc. Bright then inquired whether it was true. However, a mercenary noticed some footsteps from the orc. Bright then mentioned that the orc had been there and instructed the others to follow the tracks. As the mercenaries discovered the footsteps of the orc, Teslan pondered that the basic magic spell hadn't even cleared up the footsteps. However, Teslan informed them that the dwelling was his, and he couldn't simply allow them entry. Bright became angry and told Teslan that he had lost his mind, questioning how a brat from the backwoods could dare to block their way. But the other mercenary became a little worried and told Bright that Teslan didn't seem normal. However, Bright reassured him, pointing out that there were over ten of them, so there was no need to be afraid. Then Bright instructed Teslan to cease his fooling around and move aside, acknowledging his physical prowess but dismissing him as merely a child. After performing another magic spell to create a mage, Teslan pondered his master's earlier advice about the lethal potential of his fists. He then questioned his master about what course of action he should take. In response, his master instructed him to exhibit suitable mercy towards the weak and to recognize that wielding a weapon is an act of mercy for someone who is more formidable with bare fists than with arms. Teslan took a weapon from the mage, explaining that if he were to strike, it wouldn't be fatal. He noted that although Jim Unbreakable's clan primarily focused on unarmed martial arts, they still included weapon training. Seeing Teslan take up a weapon, the mercenary commented that the brat had grabbed a club. He wondered if he wanted to challenge them, acting as if he possessed some skills. However, Teslan started the fighting and proceeded to defeat them one by one. So the mercenaries decided to attack Teslan together. Teslan continued to engage with the mercenaries single-handedly. However, the sole purpose of this club arts, the only weapon technique, is not for combat, but more to rigorously train disciples. Teslan mentioned that it was evident they were mercenaries who earned their livelihood through swordsmanship. So it specializes in striking all over the opponent's body. There are no defensive moves, only offense. During the fight, a mercenary swung his sword at Teslan's back. However, the mercenary was shocked to see that the attack didn't harm Teslan, instead, the sword became bent. Teslan also defeated the mercenary, wondering why the sword failed to affect him. He questioned whether his body was truly human, finding the situation excessive. The best part of this club art is that it doesn't kill your opponent. Even after defeating the mercenaries brutally, Teslan assured them not to worry because they weren't going to die. Even if your joints break and bones get smashed. As Teslan fought off the mercenaries, he repeatedly assured them that they wouldn't perish, emphasizing that no one was to die, regardless of the circumstances. Despite Teslan's club breaking during the confrontation with the mercenaries, Bright bravely approached him with a sword, demanding to know his name. Teslan laughed and proceeded to beat him as well, commenting that it seemed Bright still hadn't gotten his act together. He implied it wouldn't be fair if he were fine while his friends were not. After Bright was beaten by Teslan, he pleaded for someone to help him. Finally, Teslan stopped beating him and instructed them to leave. Bright expressed gratitude for being allowed to go. With the broken club in his hand, Teslan remarked that it had been quite enjoyable to beat them up. He expressed regret that the altercation had come to an end, musing aloud about the prospect of taking on disciples and giving them a similar experience in the future. Unknowingly, he was getting influenced by Jim Unbreakable's philosophy. As the hunters left, the orc emerged from the secret door and bowed his head to Teslan, expressing his gratitude. He thanked Teslan for his kindness and vowed to remember this day until his life's end, promising to repay Teslan's kindness. After witnessing the orc bowing his head, Teslan inquired whether it was customary for a warrior to bow so readily. The orc responded to Teslan, expressing gratitude for saving his life and opening a new path for him. He declared Teslan as his mentor, promising to wield his sword in loyalty when the occasion arose. In the culture of orcs, a mentor is seen as a guide in life, someone to be revered. It's similar to how a knight serves his lord for humans. Then the orc requested that Teslan reveal his name. Teslan was about to introduce himself as Teslan, 
but then he paused, reflecting for a moment before opting to identify himself as Reifenhart, specifically Reifenhart Wald and Terry's. The orc stated that he would remember his name. Teslan inquired of the orc where he intended to go, stating that the world belonged to humans and questioning his destination. The orc responded that the continent was vast and expressed the need for a place to rest his body. If such a place was not available, they stated a preference for wandering until death rather than living as slaves. Teslan informed the orc that beyond the Larched Mountains, a fortnight's walk to the southeast, lay a nameless wasteland, referred to by the orcs as the Land of Trails. He advised the orc to go there, mentioning rumors of orcs living in hiding, specifically the Blue Bear tribe. He concluded by expressing his intention to depart. When the orc took his leave from Teslan, Teslan asked him what his name was. The orc replied that he was the son of Crota, heir to Lat's axe, and his name was Tathid. Teslan was shocked upon hearing the name, Tathid, realizing that the guy was indeed Tathid. One of the four heavenly kings, the great warrior, Tathid. He was the chief of the Blue Bear tribe and later became the grand chieftain of the orcs. Teslan scratched his head, pondering whether the original Teslan had encountered Tathid in a previous life. He speculated that, given his personality, the original Teslan wouldn't have assisted an orc, so it appeared fate had shifted its course. As Tathid departed, Teslan remarked from afar that it had been a truly intriguing and fateful encounter. With a smile on his face, Teslan recalled the memories of the Land of Trails, the Four Heavenly Kings, and his old self. He hoped to meet them all again someday, considering them descendants of the brave warrior. Half a year had elapsed since the peculiar encounter with Tathid. Gerard was training Teslan in the technique of Chi Bullet. The training seemed overly rigorous for Teslan, as Gerard looked ready to strike him with a clenched fist. Despite Gerard's formidable attack, Teslan cleverly employed Spiral Guard, generating a shield that deflected the onslaught. Gerard acknowledged Teslan's mastery, expressing his admiration and reminiscing about when Teslan had adamantly claimed he was Reifenhart, even after enduring severe beatings. Teslan asked Gerard, slightly annoyed, why he brought up an incident from six years ago. Gerard, adopting a serious tone, reminded Teslan that it had been a decade since their lessons began. He acknowledged Teslan's growth in strength but questioned why he remained physically diminutive. Embarrassed, Teslan replied to Gerard, puzzled by what he meant by small, noting that he stood over 190 centimeters tall. Gerard, growing irritated, dismissed this as nonsensical, stating that a member of the gym Unbreakable should be no less than two meters tall, citing the heights of the Marshall Kings, Valkenshut, Calbrain, and Rastal. Teslan recalled that the Teslan he had met was about 2.3 meters tall but explained to Gerard that he believed it was simply a constitutional matter. Privately, he thought it was impossible for him to grow any larger, using the breathing technique now would only make his body monstrous. Gerard reassured Teslan that being sturdy, regardless of height, was sufficient. Later, at the frozen river, Gerard instructed Teslan to demonstrate the culmination of his training. As Teslan initiated the Calamity Horn technique, a fiery circle encased him, his eyes shifting color, and he levitated. He then clenched his fist and unleashed the fourth superposition Calamity Horn, striking the ground powerfully. The impact shattered the ice of the Frege River, scattering ice shards in all directions. Observing Teslan's success, Gerard expressed his pride, remarking that it was excellent and adding that Teslan wouldn't have suffered defeat from someone like that now. Teslan, feeling satisfied and elated, exclaimed that he had mastered the fourth superposition of Calamity Horn. Gerard then hinted that it was nearly time for Teslan to explore the world beyond their training grounds. Teslan, seeking clarification, asked, Pardon? Gerard praised him for his accomplishments and addressed him as Reifenhart, his disciple, declaring that Teslan was now free to live as he wished. Gerard expressed his indifference to whether Teslan chose a path of good or evil, emphasizing that he should live the life he desired. He explained that this freedom was the reward for the arduous training Teslan had undergone. Teslan became emotional upon hearing Gerard's declaration. 
Gerard continued, recalling advice from Master Rastal, the third martial king, given sixty years prior. Master Rastal had outlined three principles. First, he advised that accumulating wealth was acceptable but cautioned against using unjust means. Gerard had questioned if this meant he could be a villain, to which Master Rastal replied that if so, it should be done with dignity and style. Second, Master Rastal emphasized standing by those unjustly treated whenever possible, suggesting a life of respect and praise was preferable. Gerard had sought clarification on prioritizing the unjustly treated over the weak. Master Rastal explained that weakness doesn't necessarily equate to unjust treatment and encouraged Gerard to discern how to identify the truly weak. Lastly, Master Rastal stressed the importance of perpetuating the martial legacy of the gym unbreakable at any cost. Gerard conveyed these teachings to Teslan, instructing him to find a disciple to pass on their formidable legacy. Teslan affirmed he would take this to heart. Gerard reassured him that finding a suitable disciple wouldn't be easy and advised not to obsess over it but to seize the opportunity when it arose. Gerard then threw a large and a small bag to Teslan, instructing him to take them as they contained his clothes and travel expenses. Teslan, upon opening the smaller bag and finding only thirty silver coins, expressed his disappointment. He remarked to Gerard that he had believed Gerard possessed considerable wealth, referencing his mansion in the capital of the Vasili kingdom. Although he had expected more, Teslan acknowledged that the amount would still cover half a year's living expenses for a commoner. Gerard, chuckling, spoke to Teslan about the fixed payment tradition for those descending the mountain from their martial clan. He noted that the sum had been adjusted for inflation, but in his time, it was about twenty-five silvers. Gerard then handed Teslan a map, mentioning a small gift he had personally left at Serilard Mountain. He encouraged Teslan to visit the location if he found himself nearby. As Teslan was leaving the place where he had spent the last seven years in rigorous training, he looked back, questioning whether it was truly permissible for him to leave the mountain and if he had indeed been freed from that place. Suddenly, Teslan saw a large fire erupting from the mountain and exclaimed, Mamma Mia! Gerard, having ignited the fire, excitedly told Teslan to proceed as his disciple, urging him not to mourn over partings but to forge ahead with unwavering determination, affirming Teslan's role as the inheritor of the greatest teachings on earth. Frightened by Gerard's daunting appearance, Teslan screamed and fled. The scene then shifted to a village where a worker expressed concern to the village chief about the potential danger. The village chief insisted on speaking his mind, even to a noble. Edward, a noble, asked the village chief what was amiss. The village chief, requesting payment for food consumed by Edward and his knights, was met with disdain as Edward flung a coin at him, claiming it should suffice. The village chief, examining the ducat, informed Edward that the payment was inadequate. Edward, angered, accused the village chief of exploiting his noble status to avoid proper negotiation and then physically attacked him, berating him for mocking his knighthood. Some villagers, witnessing the altercation, commented that the nobles were as ruthless as bandits, criticizing them for exploiting their resources while offering scant compensation. They questioned whether the chief had even considered the costs of transportation and labor. Stefan arrived and inquired about the situation. Edward dismissed it as trivial, while Stefan, observing the villagers' reactions, remarked that such individuals were despicable and emphasized the importance of not showing mercy to peasants, who he claimed often forget their place. Reifenhardt had been spending some quality time with Cyrus in his bedroom. He asked Cyrus why she kept petting him, and she simply replied that she wanted to. Then, Reifenhardt questioned what was so nice about his thin body, and Cyrus described it as sharp and precise, resembling a well-made blade. Reflecting on this memory, Reifenhardt couldn't hold back his tears, lamenting that that was how he looked before, but now, he was more like an ultimate stone golem weapon. He apologized to Cyrus, acknowledging that this was his body now. Despite his sorrow, he couldn't help but feel a sense of pride as he added that he was much taller too. Reifenhardt gazed out of the window, lost in thought. He considered that the Cirrus of this era would likely be seventy years old now, 
roughly equivalent to 17 in human years. He noted that they were in Krom, a city located in the south of the Vasili Kingdom, and realized that Cirrus would be up for sale at Shatan's slave auction next year. Contemplating his options, he wondered if he should simply destroy the auction site and liberate her. However, he reasoned that such impulsive actions might impede his efforts to regain his magical powers. Resolving to handle the situation with financial means, he acknowledged his current lack of funds, particularly given the astronomical prices of elf slaves. Nevertheless, he reassured himself that his powerful body, skills, and knowledge of future events would provide him with an advantage. Reflecting further, he recalled hearing about an ancient ruin along the path to Chatan, sparking an idea in his mind. The scene shifted to Delphia's mage tower, where Stefan inquired of Todd whether he had yet discerned the location of the ancient ruins. Todd responded, requesting a moment longer. Todd, a 35-year-old mage specializing in archaeology, assured Stefan that he needed more time. As Stefan observed a mountain, he inquired if it was the location they sought. Todd affirmed, his young master, Stefan, confirming that it was indeed the burial site of the renowned swordsman, Sir Claude von Leides Alton. The scene shifted once again to Teslan. While traveling, Teslan mentioned that it had been three days since they had left Krom and that he was heading north toward the Hatton Mountains on the Central Road. He remarked on his amazing stamina and noted that he didn't seem to feel the cold, remarking on the peculiarity of his body. He recalled hearing stories of the former martial kings who would go around topless even in winter, though he expressed no desire to do the same. He then spoke of an ability called, Artificial Flashback, a secret technique from ancient times that allowed him to recall memories at will. Using this ability, he remembered encountering a mage named Todd at Delphia's Mage Tower, who had told him about exploring the ruins of the Hatton Mountains with the Altaians, which was actually right about now. Teslan mentioned that he had visited those ruins in his past life as well and had managed to find the real treasure that Todd's party had missed. He chuckled and mentioned that he had sold the treasures for over 2,000 gold coins, quite pleased with the profit he had made. Teslan arrived at the cattle village and remarked that it was just as he remembered. In the village, the villagers gathered inside a house and discussed various problems. One person mentioned what they should do next, while another expressed concern about the Valley of Death, stating it was a place they weren't supposed to approach. Then, someone else recalled that they had requested a guide, highlighting the potential consequences if they refused the offer. Another villager, growing angry, brought up the unfortunate situation involving the chief, who had been assaulted by the nobles. Upon hearing criticism of the nobles, another villager cautioned him to lower his voice, warning about the potential consequences if they were overheard. Among them, a brave villager named Ted stepped forward and declared that he would go. He expressed his confidence, stating that he knew the mountains better than anyone in the village and understood that he was the only viable candidate. Upon hearing that Ted had volunteered to go to the valley, risking his life, his wife and daughter burst into tears. Deep down, Ted himself didn't want to go either. As the other villagers began to express hope and encourage Ted to keep his word, his reluctance to go grew even stronger. Teslan, positioned outside the house, overheard their conversation through the window. As he pressed his face against the glass, he suggested to Ted that he could go instead of him if he preferred. Startled by the sudden sight of a stranger outside the window, Ted became afraid. He aimed his bow and arrow at Teslan and inquired about his identity, asking who he was. Teslan replied that he was just a passerby and had happened to listen in on their conversation. Ted inquired why someone would happen to trespass on someone's property and questioned if Teslan knew the region. Teslan responded that he knew it very well. Ted asked again if Teslan still wanted to go, to which Teslan affirmed that he had already been there. Ted then informed Teslan that no one had ever returned alive from the Valley of Death and questioned his decision to go. Teslan smiled and told Ted that he had already gone there, but inwardly he thought that Ted should be grateful because he was saving his life. The Valley of Death. It's called a dungeon. The remnants of the Silver Age, a long-forgotten time period. Fifty years ago, 
there was a knight from the Altaians known as Claude. At the young, age of forty-five but not young, he managed to awaken Aura. He went on all kinds of adventures, and his heroic stories were spread all over the Vasili kingdom. But fame creates arrogance. Claude went into the valley of death with just one servant and died. The problem was that the demonic sword Altaian that he took with him was also lost there. The demonic sword Altaian is the symbol of the Altaian family, which has been passed down for generations. The efforts to find that sword went on for more than fifty years. Teslon set out on his journey towards the valley with the intention of guiding the knights, accompanied by Todd, Edward, Stefan, and several other soldiers. Stefan von Rapanto Altaian assumed the position at the forefront of the group. Seeing Stefan, Teslon thought that he could be Claude's grandson. Stefan was conversing with Lelsia, a slayer elf, who remarked that he was graceful even without a horse, commending him for being a top knight. Stefan expressed his appreciation for her words. Teslon, observing the interaction between Stefan and the slayer elf, grew annoyed at the sight, commenting on their apparent enjoyment. Then Teslon commented that there was only one saint in the party, questioning if his name was Silen and expressing doubt about his ability to properly use divine spells, as well as his apparent youthfulness. He pondered if Silen could even be considered a man. Teslon also expressed a desire to speak with Todd, noting that it had been a while since they last saw each other. However, he observed that Todd and Silen seemed deeply engaged in conversation, reminiscing about how Todd used to ramble a lot, even when they were younger. However, upon seeing Todd talking with Silen so cordially, Teslon was shocked. He muttered that the atmosphere seemed strange. But then he dismissed the idea, reassuring himself that Todd was a good guy and there was no way he could be anything else. Edward noticed Teslon and commented that he had made a wise choice as a traveler. Teslon responded by saying that choosing to guide the way wasn't a big deal. Edward then mentioned to Teslon that the villagers were all too scared to take the job. Teslon acknowledged that it was understandable that they'd be scared. Edward then asked Teslon what could possibly be so scary when the kingdom's brave knights were accompanying them. Upon hearing Edward, Teslon became angry, thinking to himself that there really was no knight in the world who wasn't full of himself and that chivalry made narcissists out of men. Suddenly, several ambushes appeared out of nowhere. Upon seeing them, everyone was shocked. The ambush was coming towards the knights in a spiral shape, and as they got closer, they formed into a formation. It seemed they were about to attack everyone with their paws. As everyone readied themselves to retaliate, Stefan expressed his outrage at the ambush, condemning their attempt to attack them, humans blessed by Sayer. He then commanded his knights to attack, ordering the Altaian Knight Order into action. Todd applied his fire chain power to attack the ambush. With his power, he burns a few ambushes. On the other hand, Silen, utilizing his power, prayed for the knights, requesting that Philonens permit them fortitude and bravery. Observing Stefan's brave confrontation with the ambush, Teslon commented that Stefan's performance surpassed expectations. He noted that, when viewed from the perspective of a mage, Stefan's abilities were commendable. However, from the viewpoint of a martial artist, Teslon found the group's skills lacking, reinforcing Master Gerard's justified pride. Teslon noticed the ambush attacking the orcs as well. Since no one was paying any attention to him, he decided to intervene and save them by attacking the ambush. His attack tore the ambush into several pieces. According to the map, Teslon had come to the cattle village from Krom. If Todd's adventure story holds any truth, that guide would have perished here, ambushed by these creatures. The captain of this expedition, belonging to the Altaian family, is Stefan. One cannot claim he is a bad person, but he appears indifferent to his surroundings. Stefan focused solely on eliminating the ambushers, neglecting to rescue others amid their desperate pleas for help. When Silen expressed concerns and urged Teslon and the orcs to exercise caution due to the impending danger, instructing them to seek cover behind a tree, Teslon noted that Silen seemed somewhat more considerate. As the ambushers attacked Teslon with their feathers, he remained unbothered, 
commenting that such strikes were painless. However, when a feather hit Teslin's eye, causing him pain, he instinctively punched the creature, sending it flying away, and realized he still had unshed tears from his training. Following the night's eradication of the ambushers, Stefan directed Edward to assess the casualties, particularly inquiring about the mages' and priests' welfare. Edward confirmed their safety. Observing Stefan's exclusive concern for the mages and priests, Teslon questioned Stefan's apparent disregard for the safety of others. Stefan then delivered a motivational speech to his group, highlighting the strength of the Altaian knighthood and encouraging them to relish their well-deserved rest and savor the joy of their victory. Having the opportunity to converse with Todd, Teslon decided to seize the moment. He expressed his gratitude to Todd, acknowledging his survival was due to Todd's assistance. Todd downplayed the significance of his help, dismissing it as trivial. Teslon then mentioned that he had heard Todd was associated with Delphia's mage tower and revealed he had a friend there named Reifenhart. Surprised, Todd recognized the name, questioning if Reifenhart had a rough acquaintance like Teslon. He described Reifenhart as rather cute and kind, which made Teslon shiver as Todd affectionately spoke of him. Later, Todd questioned why Teslon had brought up Reifenhart. Teslon wondered if Reifenhart was faring well and if there had been any notable occurrences recently. Todd informed him that Reifenhart was diligently learning magic. When Teslon asked about any unusual events in the past few years, Todd reported that nothing out of the ordinary had transpired. However, Todd's description of Reifenhart's features took on a peculiar tone as he elaborated on his high nose bridge, jewel like eyes, and smooth skin. Teslon remarked that Todd resembled Gerard, though his fascination seemed solely focused on the physical aspects in a different manner. Witnessing Todd's infatuation with Reifenhart, Teslon felt a mix of discomfort and anger, pondering his next move. He considered confronting Todd aggressively but managed to curb his anger, choosing instead to inquire whether there had been any changes in Reifenhart's behavior. As Todd contemplated Reifenhart, he was visibly distracted, with water dripping from his mouth. He admitted his uncertainty to Teslon, stating that he did not particularly pay attention to Reifenhart's thoughts or actions. Before Teslon could pose another question to Todd, Silen approached and inquired if Teslon had sustained any injuries. Teslon assured him that he was unharmed and directed him toward some injured orcs, suggesting Silen attend to them. So, Silen proceeded to the wounded orcs and began administering treatment. Despite the orcs assuring him they were fine and not in pain, Silen continued his treatment, instructing them to remain still as he employed his healing powers. A knight observed Silen's efforts with the orcs and questioned why he expended his energy on them, noting their apparent resilience and ability to recover simply by licking their wounds. Meanwhile, Teslan observed that Silen's benevolence extended to treating the orcs, though he noted that Silen's care resembled that typically afforded to pets rather than people. Despite this, the orcs expressed their gratitude towards Silen. Teslon noted that the primary issue was rooted in the fundamental values of society and highlighted the challenging path ahead for the orcs to secure their rights. Teslon's frustration grew when Stefan was rude and instructed him to hurry and lead the way. In response, Teslon directed Stefan to proceed straight and then take a right, advising him to slow down as there was a stream ahead. Upon hearing Teslon's directions, Stefan questioned Teslon about his eerie tone. Teslon dismissed it, stating it was nothing. A few hours later, the knights were exhausted and discussed their encounters with a basilisk, a dire wolf, and over twenty ogres, questioning the abundance of monsters on such a small mountain. However, Teslon seemed to relish these challenges as if they were all part of his plan. He explained the presence of so many monsters by admitting he hadn't taken the usual path and had instead chosen to forge straight ahead. With an evil smile, Teslon then asked Stefan if he needed a rest. Stefan, angered, shouted at everyone to get up. Teslon, with a sinister grin, asserted his identity, claiming he had always been a mage at heart. He pointed out that he had indeed led Stefan by the quickest route, asserting that his guidance was neither deceitful nor intended to provoke irritation. Upon finally reaching their destination, 
Stefan remarked that this was the place that led to Sir Claude's demise. He expressed surprise at the presence of so many monsters on such a small mountain. Upon seeing the ancient ruins, both Paulton and Stefan were mesmerized. With excitement, Stefan inquired if this was indeed the location. Edward confirmed with certainty that it was. The group then proceeded toward the entrance of the ancient ruins, Paulton, with a mix of anticipation and awe. Finally, the knights reached the entrance of the ancient ruin, Paulton. Todd pointed out the entrance to Stefan, while Edward expressed his belief that it was safe to enter. Stefan then ordered everyone to prepare for entry. Teslan informed Stefan that he would wait outside the entrance, but Stefan, noting Teslan's completed task, told him he could leave. Teslan responded that he had no means of returning to the village alone. Stefan, acknowledging Teslan's efforts in guiding them, assured him of protection on the return journey. Though Teslan felt anger, he masked it with a smile and pondered whether they would truly protect him. Before entering the ancient ruin, Stefan loudly told his knights that a great being slept within and urged them to respect its wishes and locate the demonic sword, Altayan. His knights echoed his sentiment with a unified shout. Teslan wished them luck as they entered the ancient ruin. Once the knights were inside, Teslan smiled, noting it was time for him to begin his work. He reflected on the ancient ruins of Paulton, once a logistics base and military building during the Silver Age, remarking on the miraculous technology of that era, which held immense value today. After the knights had entered, Teslan also ventured inside alone. Walking through the ruins, he reminisced about a past investigation with Cirrus, noting how they had been happy then. In a flashback, Cirrus, pressing his ear against a wall, informed Reifenhardt of nearby sylph whispers, suggesting a hidden path. Reifenhardt praised Cirrus's keen perception, calling her his goddess. Cirrus then opened a secret door, releasing mysterious smoke. During this memory, Teslan recalled a romantic encounter with Cirrus in the danger-laden ruins, questioning his bravery for such an act. Attempting to open the secret door, he remembered the password involving Libra's left as a base, combined with the reversed seals of Aqua and Terra, joking that he essentially had the cheat sheet. While using his powers to open the door, Teslan faced challenges due to insufficient mana, attributing the difficulty to the limitations of his physical condition. Nevertheless, he successfully opened the door, continuing his secretive task within the ancient ruins. Before entering, Teslan removed his coat, remarking that he couldn't simply discard the garment he had spent ten silver coins on. He then began stretching, contemplating whether he should test his body's physical abilities. As Teslan stretched, he was suddenly alerted by the night's screams coming from the direction they had ventured into. Recalling the secret path as a backdoor connection to the third floor of the basement, he understood that its activation might be considered trespassing. A sense of tension washed over him as he remembered that this place was a military facility equipped with a mana system that triggered various security measures to deter intruders. Previously, Cirrus and he had explored this site alone, without delving into other areas. However, the situation had changed, the Altaion group was now in the basement, seemingly having fallen into a trap and descended to the second floor. On the other side, the knights faced severe difficulties. Out of nowhere, blades appeared, slicing through the ranks. Stefan witnessed the gruesome scene of one of his knights being fatally struck by a sharp weapon, collapsing in front of him. As he rushed to identify the assailant, Stefan encountered a large monster. The sheer size and terror emanating from the creature made him realize the grim reality, they were outmatched and could not hope to defeat such a demonic force. He pondered the futility of human strength against a demon of such magnitude. After plummeting to the second floor of the basement, everyone sustained injuries. Silen employed his powers, invoking the blessing of Philonence to envelop their souls with healing light, which completely healed their wounds. The knights expressed their gratitude following their recovery. Silen smiled and explained that keeping them alive was also a means of ensuring his own survival. He then recounted to Todd how he had nearly perished when the floor gave way unexpectedly, thanking Todd for his protective magic that ultimately saved them. 
Todd, however, responded with a tense expression, acknowledging their narrow escape but voicing uncertainty about their future survival. As the group proceeded and entered another hall, they were confronted by giant, frightening monsters that threw them back. The presence of these monsters instilled fear, prompting everyone to flee for their lives. Amidst the chaos, Silen cast a holy spell, chanting for Philonins to empower the knights with a mace of light and unwavering courage. Disappointed by their initial fear, Silen admonished the knights for their lack of courage and weakening resolve, then chanted again, seeking abundant and steadfast bravery for them. Bolstered by Silen's spell, the knights regained their courage and engaged the monsters in battle. Todd also contributed to the fight, chanting for the earth to reclaim its elements and using his iron steel magic to manipulate an iron sword, hurling it towards the monsters. Meanwhile, the elf Lelcia valiantly fought against the monsters, striking them with her swords. However, she was soon overpowered and struck from the flank, resulting in her being hurled against a wall and falling badly wounded. Despite her injuries, Lelcia inquired to Stefan whether she had been of any assistance. In the heat of battle, Stefan recognized her efforts, affirming that she had done well. Stefan, recognized as the strongest among them, engaged fiercely with the monsters, slaying several. Edward observed Stefan's prowess, remarking that such valor was typical of Stefan, the Knight of Resolve. Yet, despite their efforts, the threat persisted. Stefan, frustrated with the relentless foes, urged his knights to regroup, reminding them that they were in the very place where even the great knight Sir Claude had once met his defeat. As the flames hovered ominously above their heads, the knights witnessed the ceiling and floor beginning to deteriorate. Emerging from the chaos was a fire monster, spewing flames in all directions and roaring menacingly as it attacked. Confronted with this fiery threat, the knights were consumed by fear. Stefan, striving to maintain morale, urged them not to lose their resolve. However, as the fire monster advanced, even Stefan found the intense heat unbearable. Frustrated and teary-eyed from the searing flames, he lamented his vulnerability and, gripping his sword with determination, leaped towards the fire monster, proclaiming his intent to uphold the honor of the Altaian name, a title synonymous with his resolute nature. Stefan executed a shooting strike against the fire monster but was overpowered, much to the dismay of the onlooking knights. He fell to the ground, defeated. Meanwhile, Silen continued to chant, wielding his wand in an attempt to vanquish the corrupt creature with holy light. However, his efforts seemed futile as the fire monster remained unscathed and turned its fiery gaze towards Silen. Realizing his power was ineffective, Silen tensed up, covering his head in anticipation of an attack. Just then, in a surprising turn of events, something flew swiftly from behind and struck the fire monster with a powerful punch, knocking it away. It was Teslon who had unexpectedly appeared and protected Silen. After the creature was felled by a single blow, Teslon too was astonished by his own strength, recalling a past near-fatal encounter where he had been similarly struck. Noticing Lelcia and Stefan lying unconscious and wounded, along with several knights, Teslon quickly took action to move them to safety. The remaining monsters watched in stunned silence, and even Todd and Silen were shocked by Teslon's display of might. Teslon carefully lifted Lelcia, carrying her to a safer area while fending off any monsters that dared approach. As Stefan regained consciousness, he immediately felt a throbbing pain in his head. Edward, Noticing Stefan's awakening, inquired if he was alert. Scanning the surroundings, Stefan observed that all the monsters had been vanquished, their bodies scattered across the floor. Confused, he listened as Edward recounted the events leading to their defeat. Astounded by the tale, Stefan queried if the person responsible was actually a martial artist. Seeking to know more about the mysterious savior, Stefan asked Teslon for his name, not recognizing him as someone of considerable renown. Teslon, on the brink of revealing his name as Teslonhart, abruptly remembered that Todd was acquainted with the real Teslonhart from the Mage Tower. Consequently, he introduced himself simply as Refin. Edward, reflecting on the name, found it unfamiliar and wondered why he had never heard of such a formidable individual before. Intrigued, Stefan asked Teslon about his family background. 
Teslan disclosed that he did not belong to any family. This revelation led Stefan to speculate whether Teslan was just an ordinary person, initially assuming he might be a noble's child on a journey of experience, only to realize Teslan had no notable background, which he found slightly distasteful. Stefan placed his hand on Teslan's shoulder, stating that it seemed Teslan had concluded what they had nearly accomplished themselves. He acknowledged Teslan's efforts as satisfactory and somewhat helpful. Teslan, irked by Stefan's presumption to take credit, retorted by questioning Stefan's recollection of the events and pointed out Stefan's lack of assistance. This response angered Stefan, who admonished Teslan to show respect towards the Altaian family. Edward, witnessing Stefan's irritation, tried to pacify the situation by rationalizing that someone as seemingly ordinary as Teslan might not be versed in proper etiquette. Stefan agreed with Edward, suggesting that Teslan appeared to lack a proper upbringing. However, Stefan's curiosity persisted, and he asked Teslan who had taught him his skills. Teslan responded vaguely that he had picked up his skills here and there, consciously avoiding mentioning Master Gerard's name, given Gerard's global renown. He also didn't want Gerard to become aware of his actions. Stefan expressed his disbelief and confusion over the casual way Teslan described acquiring such advanced skills. Meanwhile, Teslan, nonchalantly scratching his ear, advised Stefan to focus more on caring for the injured rather than probing into his background. Edward observed Teslan's demeanor, noting the natural ease with which he handled the conversation. Teslan gestured towards the injured knights, inquiring if assistance was needed. Observing Teslan's authoritative tone, Edward reflected on the arrogance in his speech, likening it to someone in a position of power speaking down to subordinates, regardless of their age. He speculated about Teslan's origins, considering the possibility that he might have royal lineage from another realm, finding Teslan to be an enigmatic figure. Out of nowhere, Silan approached Teslan, asking if he had introduced himself as Rifen and inquired about his height. Teslan confirmed he was around 192 centimeters tall. With glowing eyes, Silan then asked about his weight, to which Teslan admitted he didn't know as he hadn't weighed himself recently. When Silan probed about his training methods, Teslan shared that he engaged in a lot of physical activity, including eating well and lifting weights. Sensing something peculiar in Silan's demeanor, Teslan wondered about the unexpected friendliness. Silan, with a spark in his eyes, exclaimed that he had known it, suggesting that martial artists wouldn't easily reveal their training secrets. Silan Phil Marcy's, who had lost his parents early and was raised in an orphanage, was often bullied due to his frail and attractive appearance. Perhaps that spurred his longing for what he lacked, a robust physique and a deep, resonant voice. He once dreamt of becoming a monk, proving his devoutness through his physicality. However, reality fell short of his dreams, his height remained the same, puberty eluded him, and for some reason, his hair grew exceptionally fast. Despite his frailty, he attempted weight training in hopes of overcoming his physical limitations, only to increase his divine power inadvertently while treating his training injuries. This led him to admire those with muscular builds. Teslan, feeling uneasy under Silan's admiring gaze, attempted to cover his body with his hand and excused himself, stating he needed to scout for the exit. Despite Teslan's effort to distance himself, Silan insisted on accompanying him, running behind and expressing his eagerness to join. Teslan expressed concern about the possibility of someone getting injured in his absence. Realizing this, Silan became disappointed, acknowledging that he wouldn't be able to accompany Teslan. Stefan then declared that he would accompany Teslan. He instructed Lelsia to stay behind and assist the others. Stefan asked Teslan if it was acceptable for him to join, to which Teslan responded that he should do as he pleased. As Stefan and Teslan ventured to find the exit, Stefan found himself constantly observing Teslan, his thoughts wandering. He couldn't help but recognize Teslan's valuable assistance, albeit it seemed like a mere coincidence. From Stefan's perspective, a country bumpkin like Teslan aiding a knight was remarkable. He believed Teslan should feel honored by his ability to assist a knight. Yet, Stefan was irked by Teslan's confident and independent demeanor, 
which he perceived as a superiority over knights. With a malevolent smile, Stefan fantasized about a scenario where Teslon would kneel before him, seeking praise, eagerly anticipating a moment to demonstrate his prowess and humble Teslon in the face of a demon. However, before he could delve deeper into his thoughts, Stefan was suddenly attacked by an unknown assailant. Teslon was revealed to be the one who had knocked Stefan unconscious, suggesting he take a nap as they were nearly at their destination. After dealing swiftly with monsters approaching aggressively, Teslon discovered a concealed door leading to a room filled with treasures. His excitement mounted as he surveyed the treasure trove, identifying fifty gold coins from the Silver Age and eagerly searching through the riches. He eventually found what he had been seeking, the Limitless Bag, a magical tool capable of storing items up to ten times the size of the bag itself, with the weight reduced to a tenth. Among the treasures, Teslon rediscovered the Heavenly Brazier, Returning Dagger, and Magical Sapphire, exclaiming joyously about the wealth of expensive items he had uncovered. Meanwhile, Stefan regained consciousness, puzzled about what had transpired and how he had become unconscious. With a sly smile, Teslon informed Stefan that he had been knocked out by one of the monsters with a hit to the back of the head. Stefan, annoyed by the day's unfortunate events, thanked Teslon for his assistance, which Teslon casually dismissed as trivial. Internally, Teslon humorously considered the possibility of needing to knock Stefan out again. During the cleanup of the ancient relic site, Stefan was knocked unconscious three more times by Teslon, who hesitated each time he struck, contemplating the potential harm he might cause. He rationalized that Stefan would likely lead a good life regardless, so it should be acceptable. After regaining consciousness yet again, Stefan grew increasingly frustrated, wondering if something was wrong with him, given his inability to detect any threats. He resolved to eat something nourishing once back to bolster his strength. Teslon, with the limitless bag now full, decided to return another time to retrieve the rest of the treasures. As they prepared to head back, having explored most of the paths, Teslon joined Stefan and the knights, allowing Silen an opportunity to converse with him. Silen questioned Teslan's status, hinting at the possibility of him being of royal descent, given his capabilities. Teslan dismissed this, asserting he was just a regular citizen, and questioned if it was unusual for someone of ordinary status to be skilled. Silen noted Teslan's condescending manner of speaking, suggesting it seemed natural for him. As Teslan puzzled over this, Silen explained that, as a martial artist, such confidence and demeanor were necessary, especially in dealings with figures like Sir Stefan. However, he expressed surprise at Teslan's similar attitude toward Sir Edward, who was much older. Realizing the implications, Teslan, only twenty-two in this life, acknowledged his need to be more cautious and admitted his unfamiliarity with meeting new people, which explained his social faux pas. Upon reaching a formidable door, the group was taken aback when Stefan opened it to reveal a giant monster known as Grelbeast on the other side. Teslan, puzzled by the presence of this creature, remarked that he didn't recall it being there before. Stefan suggested that perhaps the demon served as the guardian of the place, which prompted Teslan to wonder if the monster had previously been dealt with. As Grelbeast roared menacingly, Teslan advised everyone to retreat, citing the challenge they would face with their current forces. However, the situation took a turn when one of the knights pointed out the sword that Grelbeast wielded. Upon closer inspection, Stefan recognized it as the demonic sword Altaian. The sight of the sword ignited a fierce determination in Stefan to reclaim it. Edward, sensing the danger, questioned Stefan's intent to engage the demon. Stefan, undeterred, responded rhetorically, highlighting the obviousness of their course of action. Edward cautioned that it was too perilous to confront the demon now and suggested they return to their family to properly prepare, given they now knew what they faced. Stefan, driven by a relentless resolve, dismissed the idea of retreat. He couldn't bear the thought of the great knight's sword being tarnished by the monster, expressing a steadfast determination to retrieve the sword, regardless of the risks, even if it meant facing the grim reaper himself. With a call to arms, Stefan rallied everyone to raise their swords, readying them for battle against Grelbeast. The group, fueled by Stefan's fervor, 
held their swords high, prepared to charge at the monster. Observing their readiness to attack, Teslan silently considered the recklessness of their actions, thinking them foolish for underestimating the grave threat posed by Grelbeast. Of the dimensional ruins from the Silver Age, there existed a system designed to automatically compensate for its own weaknesses. However, due to a system malfunction, supernatural monsters were absorbed by the defense mechanism. These entities, once free and known as guardians of the dungeon, were now coerced into serving as unpaid laborers, forcibly integrated into the ruined systems. This integration made the monsters significantly more formidable. Teslan, contemplating the dire situation, speculated on how the demon, now a guardian of the dungeon, had managed to defeat Sir Claude, rumored to be an aura user. He reasoned that if a demon of higher rank than Tagrel had been transformed into a dungeon guardian, it must have acquired extraordinary powers from another dimension. Stefan, seeing the chained monster, rallied his knights by questioning their courage against a restrained foe. Teslan, concerned about the apparent hopelessness of the confrontation, questioned Edward about his decision to engage the monster, warning that it could only lead to certain death. Edward, acknowledging Teslan's help yet dismissing his perspective, argued that there were causes worth risking everything for, implying that Teslan, as a mere barbarian, could not comprehend the concept of honor. As the knights charged towards Grelbeast, Stefan exhorted them to demonstrate their valor by risking their lives. Teslan, watching the rush, skeptically noted their previous failure to defeat Tagrel and doubted their ability to succeed against a more formidable foe. During the battle, Silen prayed for the knights, invoking the blessing of the goddess Philonens, hoping it would protect them. The knights, full of resolve, commanded the wicked demon to depart as they engaged it. However, as they approached Grelbeast, the monster unleashed its power, striking them with its sword. One by one, the knights fell, defeated by the demon's overwhelming strength. Teslan, observing the carnage with disappointment, remarked on the knights' predictable failure, having warned them of the futility of their actions. As another knight was violently thrown by Grelbeast, Teslan commented on the severity of their defeat, noting just how badly the knights were being overpowered. Despite Grelbeast being chained, its strength overwhelmed anyone who dared approach. The knights, although valiant, were increasingly battered and injured. Stefan, ever the leader, rallied his troops, reminding them that they were the Altaian knights and that even the demon feared their courage. Teslan, observing the unfolding chaos, began to form a clearer picture of Stefan's character, a man of unwavering resolve, seemingly impervious to advice or caution. He noted that Sir Edward seemed more grounded in reality, perhaps understanding the grim odds they faced. As for Stefan, Teslan wryly commented on his efforts, likening them to flying like a butterfly and stinging like a bee, though in reality, Stefan's attacks barely made an impact on the monstrous Grelbeast. Meanwhile, Silen channeled his divine powers, fervently chanting for Philonens to smite the evil being with its holy mace. He wielded the Philonens wand like a weapon, hurling it repeatedly at Grelbeast in a desperate attempt to subdue it. Amid the chaos, Lelcia demonstrated remarkable prowess. She leaped over Grelbeast's head and struck a decisive blow, causing the creature to bleed. Stefan, recognizing her effort, praised Lelcia's contribution as substantial. Teslan, watching her skillful engagement, remarked that Lelcia's capabilities might even surpass Sir Edward's, considering her perhaps the second strongest in their group. As the battle raged, Todd summoned the chilling embrace of the northern wind, creating a tempest that swirled around the combatants. The ambience of the room shifted dramatically from blue to red, signaling a change in the defense system of the ruins, current defense system overwhelmed transitioning to phase two. At this critical juncture, the chain restraining Grelbeast snapped, freeing the demon to unleash its full fury. Teslin's face fell as he realized the escalation of the threat, the situation had taken a dire turn. No longer bound, Grelbeast shifted from defense to offense, launching powerful kicks at the knights. The blows were devastating, sending knights sprawling and retreating in pain and confusion. As Stefan bravely stepped forward to challenge Grelbeast, his effort was met with a brutal rebuttal as the beast swiftly knocked him aside, causing him to bleed from the mouth. 
Edward, witnessing this, called out in concern, relieved to find Stefan still conscious and responsive despite his injuries. Meanwhile, Lelcia, seeing an opportunity, charged at Grelbeast aiming to strike with her sword. However, as she was about to stab it with her sword, Grelbeast unleashed a stream of fire from its mouth, causing Lelcia to sustain severe injuries. As Grelbeast continued to spread fire from his mouth, attacking the knights with flames, the knights had to flee. In the midst of this fiery chaos, Silen was caught off guard, frozen in shock as the flames drew near. Just then, Teslon emerged, swiftly moving to protect Silen from the onslaught. With remarkable agility, Teslon not only shielded Silen but also skillfully redirected the fire away from them. Apologizing for his initial slow reaction, Teslon then turned his attention to Grelbeast, stepping forward to confront the monster himself. As Teslon faced Grelbeast, he felt a surge of curiosity mixed with determination. Awakening his aura, he pondered his own capabilities, questioning whether his martial skills were enough to take on such a formidable opponent. Reflecting on his previous life as a mage, where he would have shied away from such direct confrontation, Teslon now relished the challenge as a warrior. With a confident smile, he thought of his progress and how his master would have been proud of his evolution. Heeding Gerard's advice to strike first when in doubt, Teslon moved closer to engage Grelbeast. But as he did, the creature unleashed a swift attack with its sword, cutting through Teslon's defenses and leaving him wounded. Despite his body's resistance to steel, the demonic sword inflicted visible scratches on him. Then, with a powerful kick, reminiscent of a horse's force, Grelbeast sent Teslon crashing into a wall, causing him to bleed from his mouth. Witnessing this, Silen exclaimed Rifen's name in concern. As Teslon slowly stood up from the debris, his aura palpably awakened, casting a brilliant glow around him. He reassured Silen with a slight nod and a calm voice that he was all right, dismissing the severity of his injuries. Silen, witnessing the manifestation of Teslon's aura, was utterly astonished, questioning to himself if this was indeed the legendary power of an aura user. Teslon, while nonchalantly scratching his neck, reflected internally on the missed opportunity for a counterattack. The rigorous training under his master had ingrained a strong defensive instinct in him, leading him to parry instinctively. Despite the situation, he saw this as a valuable moment to refine his combat techniques further. Meanwhile, Grelbeast uttered something indecipherable, its voice a rumbling growl that Teslon couldn't understand. Ignoring the confusion, Teslon advanced, ready to re-engage. The battle that ensued was fierce, with both Teslon and Grelbeast exchanging powerful blows, each strike echoing throughout the chamber. From a distance, Stefan observed the intense confrontation, particularly taking note of Teslon's glowing aura. It struck him profoundly, how could Teslon, seemingly a commoner without noble heritage or the honor typically associated with knights, manifest an aura so powerful, while he, born of noble lineage, had yet to achieve such a feat. This revelation shook Stefan, challenging his beliefs about nobility and power. Grelbeast let out a thunderous roar, its frustration and rage palpable in the air. Stefan watched in disbelief as Teslon skillfully maneuvered around Grelbeast's attacks. The sight of Teslon dominating the battle shocked Stefan further. He found himself questioning everything he knew about Teslon, who was this man who seemingly came from nowhere yet displayed such formidable prowess. How could someone he perceived as a mere lowborn possess such extraordinary abilities? The climax of the fight arrived as Teslon delivered a decisive blow, effectively ending the battle. Grelbeast collapsed, defeated solely by Teslon's hand.